had two great, great teachings. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to be flattering anybody. Uh, Jacob set it up. David drove the point home. Now Lynn and Sarah are going to take us from our lunch into the second half of our conference, uh, which is session three and four, and Sandy will be the last one. Uh, but they're going to talk about some of the threats again. They, uh, Lynn and Sarah Leslie from Heroscope Ministries, they've done a lot of research on a lot of different aspects of of, of, of the faith, the Christian faith, but they've, they've also been believers for quite a long time. I'm not talking about their age in the sense of how old they are. Sorry, Lynn, no offense. Uh, but the reality is they bring a maturity and a, uh, a longevity of standing for the faith and living in difficult times, because we've lived through difficult times. 21st century has its own challenges, but they've stood in the face of people coming against them in the church, the world coming against them, uh, false leaders coming against them, as uh, David pointed out about the hirelings and the, these pastors that have gone away from the faith, and they've stood the test of time. So they have some metal in their, in their hearts and in their soul, and they've, God's built some strength in them and some steel in their hearts, and, um, and they're willing to share with us not only what the Lord has taught them, but some of the dangers that are going on, and really encourage you. We had a, a conversation about that when I invited them, and I, and when I told you, said, when Anthony brought up the conference and we thought about doing it, I thought, well, who do we want? Who, do we, who is the Lord pointing to? Not just us, but and like I said, we brought the speakers here that I believe will tell you the truth, and I can't imagine uh, having a conference about this kind of magnitude without Lynn and Sarah Leslie helping us to understand what's going on. So please help me welcome Lynn and Sarah Leslie. Thank you, Pastor Marco. It's good to be here today. We're going to have a little fireside chat with you, if you will. Um, I'm Lynn. This is Sarah. Uh, we're happy to be here today. We wish we could be there uh, with you personally. Um, uh, it's just we've been fellowship. We fellowship with you there at DeVore before, and, and we missed the opportunity to do that. Uh, we pray that we'll have opportunity again in the future. What we'd like to share with you today is a little bit of our journey. Marco alluded to it that we uh, have some years behind us. Um, and I would have to say that having grown up in the 50s and 60s, I've seen more change in the world in the last three years yeah. than I've seen in the 65 years prior to that. Um, things are just happening very rapidly. And, and we as believers must be prepared to deal with that change. Um, but we also need to face it in, in light of what the scripture says. And, and for some time now, this verse in Proverbs has, has struck out to me, stuck out to me, uh, Proverbs 24 Verse 21, my son, fear the Lord and the king and meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them that are given to change. But yet, what do we see going on all the time is change. And that's been a part of our lives, you know, for the five or six decades we've walked the earth. Um, but at one point in time, I received training in human resources to be a change agent. And that's what we have running our corporations and our governments today. All have been trained up to be change agents. Um, and, and that's really a cause for concern to me. And, 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 and I know to Brother Jacob and, and Pastor David, I can see that on your heart as well. Um, but that, that idea that things must change is what the devil has had planned all along, and that's what he's using. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of what it is to be trained as a change agent. Um, much of that is very specialized, but I want you to watch for certain things as you go about your daily lives to see how these things are brought being brought to bear in our lives, because 
at no other time in history have we seen corporations rise to the level that they have. You have, you have corporate structures that control more wealth than many nations of the world. Corporations here in America that, that control more wealth. And that wealth is being used to take control. Um, and the way that they take control and they uh, use the change process is through the dialectical process. And what, what they do with that is try to create a tension between what's going on, you know, what's true and what's not. The gap between the ideal and, and, the, and the real. We'd like, we all have this, they all have this ideal structure that they want out there. Utopia, that's what we're looking for. But we know what's real. And they keep that tension going between the real and the ideal to get us to change. And that's been going on for a number of years. It's called the dialectical process where you have thesis, which is facts. You have the antithesis or antithesis, which in this situation is feelings. And then you go through the process of synthesis to come to something that's in the middle. So if you have truth on one side and error on the other, what they're doing is bringing, bringing it together so that you have truth mingled with error. And in a personal way, when we do that, we have facts and feelings. And so we justify mm. how, why we do things based on our feelings. How are you going to resolve those issues? Well, in Philippians 4, 19, we have to say, but God, my God, shall supply all of my, your need according to this, his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We need to look to the Lord and hold steadfast to his principles and his promises and be ready to stand up and say, these things are right. These things are wrong. We're not going to meet you in the middle. We're not going to justify wrong in that way. <laughs> well, as Lynn said, we're old now. <laughs> He's an old man. I'm an old woman. We're grandparents. And um, I, I got saved 50 years ago this year out of the hippie movement. I came out of Eastern mysticism, transcendental meditation, the whole drug hippie culture, that sort of thing. And um, I just want to say that the day I got saved was November 12th, 1971. And there was a young woman from Open Bible College in Des Moines, Iowa, that came to my dormitory. I was on Drake University campus. And she was standing there in the doorway. And I was standing there across from her. And she was just looking at me. And she had bright red hair. She was really, really cute. And um, she was holding something in her arms like this. And she just looked at me and she said, do you know Jesus? And I have to tell you that I, I literally crumbled. I could feel the Holy Spirit just fall upon me. And I said, no, but I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. And so she led me to the Lord. And for the next few months, I was discipled by a couple that had come out of Berkeley, California, that Jesus movement. And they knew how to give me enough grounding in the faith to keep me barely alive as a baby infant Christian. One of the very first things that I had to do was reconsider what did I believe? Because both Lynn and I were raised in Protestant churches. In my particular church, the gospel was dead. In his particular church, the gospel was dead. It was form and function with no life in it. There was no salvation message. And I had to discover that Jesus was real, that he wasn't a myth because I had been told he was a myth. By the time I was 15 years old, I was actually told that the whole Bible was a myth and that I could write my own code of ethics, how I was going to live my life. And I actually had to write it down in order to be confirmed at my church. So guess what my code of ethics was? I'll do anything for kicks. 
I was a very bright 15 year old, <laughs> very bright. So that's about how I ruined my life is I do anything for kicks. So when I discovered Jesus, the very first thing I had to learn was that he's real, that he lived on earth at a time and a place, and that he actually died, uh, physically died on the cross, and that he actually rose again and was resurrected. And that became a stumbling block for me for the next four or five years of my life. Because no matter what other religion I tried, no matter what other thing I pursued, I even tried to become a Baha'i for a while. I, I was way off course, and uh, I'll explain some of that later, but I, I definitely went through some psychological manipulation in my college classes. But the end result was that every time I would think about any other world religion, I would stumble on that rock that Jesus had rose from the dead and therefore everything else in the Bible must be true. It's, it's interesting when we think back, um, you know, as I said, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and I, it, I was struck today as Jacob was talking about how things happened back in Christ's time, the debauchery and, and the things that were going on politically and that type of thing. But if you look at what's gone on in this country, the adage came to me of the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, but yet we want to see this change happen. And the way it's happening today is to bring, you know, social pressure upon us. Um, Back in the 60s, there was a missile crisis, if you recall. The Soviet Union had said, we will bury you. And Nikita Khrushchev was the uh, premier of Russia, of the Soviet Union, who said that. And everyone got all excited about, it. what does he mean they're going to bury us? Are we going to have a nuclear war? You know, we were building bomb shelters in our homes, storing food in schools and city halls in case there was a nuclear winter that came as a result of the fallout and all that. And so it was, let's keep everybody in a case, constant state of turmoil so that we can bring them into submission, if you will, with what we have planned. Fast forward now to 2021, and what do we see happening out in the world today? We see chaos on every hand. We see rioting in the streets. We see politicians on both sides of the aisle in the U.S. taking positions to try to, to bring people into submission to what they want done. Um, we have to be able to withstand that. And it starts with the little things when we do that. Um, I'll give you an example Years ago, I worked at, a, at the city of Des Moines, Iowa, and everyone in the office would go out for, for lunch, uh, for periodic um, events like Secretary's Week or Boss's Day or whatever. And they chose in my office, there were 12 or 14 of us, they chose that time to go to the Playboy Club, which mm -hmm. had just opened in town, to have lunch. I said, very quietly, but directly, I'll stay back at the office and answer the phones while you all go to lunch at the Playboy Club. Now, was that a big deal? No, nobody made a big deal of it. But what did that say to someone? There was one other person in the office who, because I took that position, stood up and said, I'll stay back and watch the office with you and help you answer the phones. So, so that's how we as believers can take the positions that need to be taken in these times of stress and take a stand for Christ, um, being willing to accept the, the consequences for it. Many things happened after that, that gave, you know, we had more opportunity to take a stand for Christ, um, We've suffered greater consequences, but 
you have to start with those small things to move forward. Yeah, I, I will say that one of the things that we learned in our Christian life is, is that it is a walk. And uh, I know some of you have heard the story a few years ago when I testified at your church that I literally had to learn how to walk physically all over again after um, a, a health crisis. And um, I used what I had learned in my Christian life to help me to learn how to walk again physically. And that is you have to take one step at a time. And that means for me, because I wanted to know Jesus, that I would spend time in his word, because that's how we learn to know Jesus. I could have gone on dreams and visions and feelings and all sorts of other things, but those are not reliable. What is truth is God's word. And so I was, I was discipled by an older woman, praise the Lord, her name was Joyce. And her husband, Bill, had a lot of influence in Lynn's life as well. And we were also discipled together as a couple by Bob Cutberth, who himself had been discipled by Tozier. And they, they encouraged us to stay in God's word. Ah, oh, you can tell we're on Zoom. You'll hear the dog barking. <laughs> uh, they encouraged us to walk according to the word of God, to literally get up in the morning and read his word and apply that to our lives for that day. And I'll tell you, we, ha we had seven children and we homeschooled them all. Between the two of us, it was quite a task. And then we raised extra kids and we even to this day have all sorts of extra people living in our home. The Lord gave us a ministry of hospitality. There were years not months, not days. There were sometimes there were years where the only time I could get in God's word was late at night after I finally got that crabby baby to bed. <laughs> and um, is just sit there and read and feast on God's word. But that gives you that foundation that you're not on shifting sand, but God will confirm things he's telling you. When you open the word and you read the word, he will tell you, this is the truth. Yeah, you were hearing me right. Yeah, you were, you were sensing that situation. You were discerning. This is what God's word says. And I think that the, over the long haul, that's what sustained us. But I will tell you the other part, which is, this is the hard part. God's word will convict you. Over and over and over again in our life, we have had to go through repentance. In fact, there was a, an entire year early in our marriage after we had our first son where God put us through some pretty excruciating repentance. We both came from homes that had been rough in, in our lives at different times. We had backgrounds. We had experiences. And we had to go through some systematic repentance of sins that we had been involved in previously that we found that we really needed to not only repent, but recant and repudiate some of them and just experience that, that inner healing that God's Holy Spirit gives us for all the angers and the hurts and the bitternesses and things like that. I mean, Lynn's dad, your dad was an alcoholic and and uh, my mother had a very troubled life during my teenage years. And so, you know, God, God worked in our hearts. Yeah, at that time, one of the, one of the issues that God brought to my mind was that um, even though I was not drinking, um, I still had a lot of the characteristics of an alcoholic. And God took me uh, to my knees before him and said, Lord, I don't want to be like my father. I want to, I want you to be my father and, and Lord help show me how I can be the right kind of father to my children. Um, and he will answer those prayers. He does answer those kinds of prayers and it gives you the strength and the courage to, uh, to follow through day by day with the steps that you need to take to move forward. Yeah. One of the things the Lord yeah. called us to early on after we started having children 
was that he suddenly and quite miraculously propelled me to the forefront of the right to life movement in Iowa. <clears throat> and this was in the 1980s when Christians were first getting involved in politics. And the right to life issue was the number one issue that was motivating Christians to go out and start getting active and voting. And through a series of extraordinary circumstances, the Lord actually put me as the president of Iowa Right to Life Committee in the 1980s, right before the 1988 caucuses. So Lynn and I actually got to meet all of the presidential candidates on a first name basis with only one exception, and that was George Bush. We never did meet him personally. And in fact, some of them we knew very well. And we, in my position, I ran a state political action committee, a federal political action committee. I ran a 501c4 and a 501c3 corporation. And in that process, what we discovered was that politics was not the answer. We realized that what we were doing was standing on a dividing line. Either you choose life or you choose death. You had to make a choice. You can't compromise on that issue. But what we began to see is that Christians can be compromised. We began to see people bought off. We began to pe see people get compromised by their sins. In fact, one of the people that worked most closely with me fell into sin. And he, it was an old sin that even though he was born again, he fell back into. And um, by the time we left the Right to Life movement, we realized that we, we were pretty much banished from Washington, D.C., <laughs> Because we had a reputation in politics that we wouldn't compromise. And Lynn mentioned the dialectics, the very first thing that happened to us in a political meeting, the very first political meeting we ever went to, um, the man, a Christian man, got up and he said, OK, I'm going to explain the half a loaf theory to you. He says, you have a half, you have a loaf of bread. And he says, in politics, I get a half a loaf, you get a half a loaf. And so he looked right at us looked right at me and said, so you're going to learn how to compromise. And praise God, praise God. He immediately put in my brain the story of Solomon and the baby. I said, no, I'm not going to cut that baby in half. Praise God. And so from that point on, we had the reputation. We weren't going to compromise. I even had a politician come up to me once and he went like this. Well, I see what way the wind's blowing. I guess I'll be pro-life from now on. That was not conviction. He did not have a change of heart. He had a change of political position. And from that point on, Lynn and I began to be aware that in for Christians, there's a big difference between having conviction. If you have a conviction, you're not going to compromise. You are going to stand. You are going to stand no matter what. You're going to stand even if somebody puts a gun in your face. You are going to stand and not renounce Jesus and not renounce scripture. But if it's a preference, yeah, okay, I'll bend with the flow. I'll go with the flow. A preference is not the same. But conviction is based on the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, God can, uh, even in small things, protect you in that way. I, about that same time, I got <clears throat> promoted to a position at City of One. I went from a personnel analyst to the assistant department director. And there was a woman accountant down the hall who came to my boss and, and just excoriated him saying, why are you promoting this guy? And we found out later the reason she was upset was because she was on the local Planned Parenthood yeah. Um, committee. Um, so even though I hadn't said anything at work, was not very outspoken about it at all. Um, she knew who I was based on my activities in the right to life movement and tried to get me um, 
fired, if you will, from my position. We could call that early cancel culture. <laughs> yes, yeah. So we, we know what it's like to be a part of, of cancel culture. Um, but but God, is, God is good and he has protected us and led us every step of the way. Um, you know, we've been enticed with offers of money. Um, you can share that one too, if you want. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, at first we need to go into the part of the story. Uh, Lynn and I have actually, we've, we've lived through persecution. Um, and, I, and I know that's one reason why Pastor Marco wanted us to speak at this conference, because back in 1989, again, through a whole series of very miraculous circumstances, the Lord um, uh, put right in front of my face a plot in Iowa to destroy homeschooling once and for all. And because I had stumbled onto this, and um, this was actually a, a real serious crisis in Iowa, because up until that point in time, they'd just been jailing homeschool parents. If you homeschooled and the state caught you, they'd throw you in jail. I knew some families we knew that had been in jail three different times. And um, the state of Iowa, it wasn't working. The more they threw parents into jail, the more Christians homeschooled. And of course, by this time, the worst public education was getting. So um, this testimony is actually published online um, under an article called Homeschooling Under Fire. If you Google our name, you know, search our names with the article Homeschooling Under Fire, you'll read the whole incredible testimony. What we learned through this is this, the state of Iowa wanted to come in and since it didn't work to put us in jail, they wanted to take our children away from us, literally come to the house with social workers, raid our house and take our children. And uh, they did this to an Indian family that lived on an Indian reservation, the Barry Bear family. And then they had the intention, once they established some court case precedents, of actually coming in with legislation to codify this into law. And then they had their test cases where they had certain families they'd picked out that they were going to go after. Well, wouldn't you know it that the Lord put us in a position where we had to take a stand. And... Um, we had a meeting in our home on Labor Day weekend in the fall of 1989, and I was pregnant with our sixth child at that point. And Paul Zylstra, who was a homeschool leader who had just come from Nebraska, where they had also had persecution. He was at Pastor Sullivan's church when it was padlocked in the 1980s. So Paul had already lived through persecution. And by the way, right now, I'm helping him to write the story and get it published into a book. So I'll let you know when that happens. But Paul started the meeting by telling us that uh, our very presence in the meeting, which was in our house, was if, if you wanted to, you could leave. If you stayed, you could be guilty of the crime of kidnapping because the purpose of this meeting was to get Reverend Todd Taylor's children out of the state of Iowa because in his county, his county attorney had bragged that he was going to go in and take Pastor Taylor's children, because he was Christian schooling them without certified teachers and without all of the state criteria. So we formed an underground railway and started working to help get families out of the state of Iowa. And there are many, many stories of what happened and how God intervened every single time and protected and preserved those families and those children. But I will tell you that what we lived through <laughs> was really rugged because we never knew from moment by moment, hour by hour, when our house would have the knock on the door with the social workers to take our children. And um, that was like living under communism. That was a gut-wrenching experience. And the worst part of it for us was that we had to train our children how to memorize phone numbers in case they got taken by the state or in case they managed to escape out of the house and flee to a neighbor. 
where they could call somebody who was willing to take them out of the state to another family in another state who had already said they were willing to raise our children if necessary, the Underground Railway. And this went on for quite a few years. Um, you can read the story, but what can we tell you? God's word comes alive when you're under persecution. All those promises in scripture that he tells us about preserving and protecting us and giving us boldness and courage and strength, they're real. And they come alive when you're under persecution. Well, and, and God will protect you in sometimes mysterious ways too. Yeah. Right? We, we didn't live in the city limits of the city of Des Moines, although I worked for the city. Uh, we lived in a suburb right next door, but there were times where I found out later uh, because my life may have been in danger that the Des Moines police would drive past my house to make sure things were okay. I worked at, uh, I hired a lot of police officers. That was a part of my job was to hire police officers and firefighters. So I knew a lot of cops and uh, I didn't know that <clears throat> they were looking out for me until after all of this had transpired. That's true. That's true. We, um, we then began publishing and uh, Sam Blumenfeld, who um, was a phonics expert, but he was also, he was a Jew who became born again because he was trying to find out why there was biblical illiteracy. Why, why there was illiteracy, why people didn't know how to read, what was going on. And he did research for years. And eventually he read Calvin's Institutes. And through that process, he got born again. And Sam Blumenfeld courageously came to our house in the middle of the persecution, right at the very beginning. And he sat us all down again in our living room because that's where the meetings took place all the time. We had a very large living room and we could accommodate about 50 people and they all had homeschool kids, we would have hundreds of people in our home. <laughs> Sam sat there and he says, okay, I know you're under persecution. You all wanna go run and hide. You wanna go put your heads under a paper bag because people had done that before an earlier persecution in Iowa. And he said, but no, you've got to stand. He says, you actually have to stand. You have to visibly stand. And he says, not only that, but you need to start publishing what's going on. And he said, I'm, I'm willing to use my newsletter to publish this story all over the country, all over the world would be where his newsletter went. And so he looked directly at us and my husband and said, are you willing to publish? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and so that means that you can't hide it under a bushel. You actually, in the middle of persecution, God was saying, I want you to stand on a hill with the light shining. Well, who are you going to trust then? Who's your protection? There's absolutely nothing physically you can do to protect yourself in those circumstances other than common sense and wisdom and whatever, obeying the Lord. So we went visible and open and began working on publishing and, um, that's that's how come we're here today through a whole series of circumstances the lord had us publish help publish a newspaper and then when that uh fell apart we um began publishing a magazine i'll show you the i'll show you a copy of the magazine the christian conscience now some of you know we published the heroscope blog very few people know that heroscope was actually a column a monthly column in this magazine um, back in the 1990s. But I will tell the story now what happened. We were writing, we were publishing a lot of articles about discerning the times, discerning what was going on in the church, discerning what was going on in society, culture, schools. And one day I got a phone call from a guy who had heard that we were going to publish a magazine. And I had met him at a previous conference and he worked in Washington, D.C. for some high up organization. And I wasn't too fond of the organization he worked for. I knew it had deeply compromised. 
And so he said, well, I have a group of investors that would like to subsidize your magazine. We're, we're willing to help you publish it. He said, we will set you up with an office with all of the office equipment and all the financing you need. And he said, we will pay you and your husband each $100,000 a year. That's a lot of money. That was a lot of money back, especially a lot of money back in the 1990s. And he said, there's only two criteria that you have to meet in order to receive this money. He said, you cannot mention the new world order and you cannot talk about Jesus Christ. It was a no brainer. I said, no, thanks. Hung up the phone and I went like this. What was that, Lord? It showed me how they were going through and systematically corrupting Christians, buying them off quite literally. If I had agreed to take that money, they would have shut down our free speech. They would have compromised us so we couldn't share the gospel and we couldn't tell what was really going on in the world. And do we see those kinds of things happening today? Yeah. Yes. On a grander scale. Uh, there's there's so much happening um, today that it just um, boggles the mind sometimes when, when, we, when we see the kinds of things that are happening and how quickly they're happening. Um, and, and we really need to focus on the scriptures, spend every moment that we can in prayer with God, um, looking to him for guidance, because it's only by his strength and through his power that we can survive these times that we're in. I um, do want to add one more thing. And I know that Marco wanted us to cover this in detail and we didn't, but you can ask us questions and the questions, but what ended up happening is um, I, I originally met Sandy Simpson and Jacob Prosh by way of Ed Tarkowski, who had one of the original internet discussion loops back in the 1990s. As soon as the internet started, he got right on there and started bringing together discerners from all over the world where we could talk to each other and compare notes. And uh, that's when we began to warn about uh, what Jacob calls it, you know, the Toronto blessing and the latter rain and that type of thing. And so we began to focus more and more on discernment. But what we learned is that um, the church, the official evangelical church, and I put that in capital letters, you know, the, the, the powers that be in the evangelical world, by the year 2000, they were already deeply, deeply compromised. And uh, they had already corrupted, they had major plans that we could read back into the 1980s and before about how they would corrupt doctrine, how they would corrupt belief, how they would change doctrine, and how they would start partnering, not only with the state, which is dominionism, which I've written extensively about, but also with corporations. You want to know where all the financing comes for these bigwigs in the evangelical world, look no further than those big corporations. I will tell you that the most important article I ever published out of the thousand articles now that we almost thousand that we have on Heroscope since 2005 as a blog is an article titled Rick Warren. Is he scary? Question mark. That article details how Bill Gates has funded Rick Warren. Why did he fund Rick Warren? Because Rick Warren had gone all over the world and data banked every Christian on the planet and every pastor on the planet and every missionary on the planet in the guise of his global peace plan. And then, of course, he set up the Daniel plan, which was a healthcare plan. All of that, when he did it 12 years ago, 15 years ago, eh, people didn't get it. Now, in the past year, since everything has happened, put two and two together and figure out what role big church is going to play in the global days to come. It's quite an eye-opener. If, if you look at the 
the amount of money and power that uh, is being wielded by corporations, foundations, and many of the large mega churches. Um, there's a lot of pressure that can be brought to bear on people to try to get them to cave and follow along with the new world order or whatever you might want to call it. Um, it can be scary. Uh, well, it, but we have the Lord. And if we look to him, we don't have to be as, as afraid of what we see going on there. Yeah, I will say that this last year, um, obviously, we are in a whole new world order. It happened very fast. It happened very suddenly, as, as the other pastor mentioned. And um, one of the things that I discovered very quickly is that a, lo a lot of Christians don't know how to set, sort fact from fiction, nor do they know how to separate truth from error. And uh, we now live in an era of incredible propaganda. You are getting propaganda at every level social media, big media, a uh, big media, especially, and uh, through all of the various things that come to your senses that you see, that you hear, and that type of thing. And um, the truth is being suppressed. Now, you can think of all sorts of ways that truth is being suppressed in this last year. In fact, in fact, what you're learning is a lot of science is being suppressed. What we normally would have considered factual science is being shut down. Now I'm I'm on a earthquake feed. I don't know if many of you even know because this is not being reported in the mainstream news, hardly at all. But all over the world right now, there are earthquakes going off and volcanoes. The only reason you're not hearing so much about the earthquakes, even though a lot of them are large, is that because they are in areas that aren't that well inhabited. But the man who was warning about earthquakes and had actually developed a model to predict earthquakes is being censored by big tech, by the powers that be, by probably our government, by scientists, and uh, this means people quite literally could die. If you don't have a good warning about the next earthquake that's going to hit, you may not be prepared. So there's danger in repressing the truth because people could die. The same thing, the same analogy is there's danger in repressing biblical truth because people can die in their sin. And I have talked to dozens of ministers in the last year who have been shut down, censored, um, every other way of repressing their ability to freely speak, especially through tech and the media. So we live in a day and age where we actually need to know how to walk with the Lord step by step again. I once heard of a missionary that got lost in the jungle of Africa. I heard his testimony on the radio when I was a born, brand new born again believer. And he was lost in the jungle and he couldn't, it was night and he couldn't see one step in front of each, each other. And the, the Lord said, listen to my spirit and I'll tell you. So he listened to the spirit of the Lord. That's all he had to go on. And God said, put your foot here, put your foot there, put your foot here, put your foot there utter darkness, blackness. He walked out of the jungle and he lived to testify of it and went all over the world trying to warn people, you need to walk with Jesus. You need to hear his voice. You need to know Jesus and you need to discern what he wants you to do. We live in dangerous, precarious, perilous times, as scripture says. And um, how do we discern? We are going to have to depend on the voice of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, and his word, which is a lamp unto our feet. When I 
when we were at a small church here in Northeast Ohio, where we now live, um, we had some issues going on with in, within the church. And I, I really appreciate what Pastor David said today about dealing with the issues that are scriptural and doctrinal and mm -hmm. not letting the peripheral divide. Because in this case, some of the, some of the periphery did get, in, get involved. Um, this was a plain church. Those of you may not be familiar with plain churches, but they try, they strive to dress differently and, and act differently to show that they are separated from the world. And biblical separation is something that the scriptures tell us we need to do. We need to come out from among them and be separate. Um, the problem was, as the discussion went, um, it was many of the men there were saying, let's, we need to have these guidelines because that's what keeps us on the straight path that keeps us on the straight and narrow following those guidelines. And those guidelines were things like the kind of clothes you wore, the kind of haircut you had. If you had a beard, you couldn't have the mustache. You had, you could only have the it beard. Was it was, it was, it was a lot of legalism. Um, and my response to that was, well, it's nice to have guardrails. Yes, the scripture does provide us with some form here that we need to follow. But if I'm bumping up against those guardrails in my car, I'm doing a lot of damage to my car. <laughs> so if I'm bumping up against those guidelines as a person, how much damage am I doing to myself? And, and how, how is that affecting my walk with the Lord and my testimony for the Lord? So I gave this analogy. It's more like I see myself as the pilot of a fighter jet trying to land it on an aircraft carrier in the dark of night where I lock onto the beacon or the radar beam that's being sent to my plane. And if I stay locked onto that, I can safely put the plane down on that deck, even though it may be pitching and rolling and that type of thing. If I don't follow that the way I should, I could end up crashing into the side of the aircraft carrier, falling off the deck or whatever. Yeah. So we as Christians need to really focus in on the word of God and our relationship with him and be in touch with his and in tune with his spirit so that we can follow that glide path to where we need to be, where he wants us to be. Early on in my Christian walk, when I recommitted my life to the Lord in 1976, one of the ladies who had helped lead me to the Lord sat me down and she said, Sarah, you need to learn obedience. Well, I gulped. I wasn't sure I even knew what obedience was. I had gone through the hippie area where we threw out all obedience. We don't obey anybody. We didn't have any higher authority we reported to. And so I went back to the Lord and I said, I guess you're going to have to teach me obedience because I don't know what it, I don't even know what it is. Well, I'll tell you what, that's the narrow path in the Christian life. That's when you take the word of God and you apply it to your life and you read that verse and you go, oh, whoa, I think I'm guilty of this sin. And you confess it and you repent it and repent of it and Jesus will forgive you. But then you go on and you don't carry that sin with you anymore. You leave it there. You leave it at the cross. And that's that daily walk again. Um, Christians nowadays, a lot of them don't even teach that anymore. You can live your life however you want. I met so many people this last year that told me they were Christians and their lives are in absolute shambles. They are covered in sins. They are dirty and filthy and they've, their families are a mess. No, that's not, that's not the Christian walk. The Christian walk is when you start cleaning house and you spiff things up and you ask God, help me, cleanse me, get me right with you, Jesus. This pandemic, I think, has brought home the idea that although we have, as Pastor David said earlier, we are to be in fellowship with the body, but it's entirely possible that that's going to become even more difficult than it is now. 
which means we really need to be in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Because as Sarah gave with her example, the, the missionary in the wilderness, we, we will find no, we will not find our way home if we don't have the Holy Spirit. You know, when, when the uh, apostles were in prison, there weren't many folks there with them but they knew that the Lord was there with them because he miraculously took them away from their, you know, their imprisonment and put them back out on the ministry path. Yeah, I, I can, I can testify. I think we both can, that when we went through persecution, we saw miracles. Yeah, it was really rugged. Yeah, it was really rough, but we saw real miracles. And so when when people talk about an end time revival, they don't even know what they're talking about because the real revival is when you know that you are totally in the Lord's hands and he's in control. And no matter, even if he throws you in a jail cell, you know that God's there and uh, you're going to feel his presence. You're going to know. It's just going to be, you know, it, it's different. It's not this great end time, you know, like they say, well, political revival. But it is a, it is a form of overcoming. Um, we have to, we have to rely on the Lord to give us the strength to overcome. But if, if you look at written in Revelation 2, um, you know, there are examples of what happens when we overcome. You know, the Lord spoke to the churches in Revelation 2, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. He that overcomes shall not hurt of the second death. Um, to him that overcome, um, I will give him to eat of the hidden manna. Um, I will give him power over the nations. He shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. He will become a pillar. I will. God says, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out. Um, and it finally, it, it's, well, and then finally he says, to him that overcomes, will I grant him to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame also, and I'm set down with my father in his throne. And he closes with this admonishment. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says under the churches. I think we're probably coming to the end of our time. Um, so we will close with that. We'll end our fireside chat at this point. Um, <laughs> but uh, I understand we will be available uh, to participate in some question and answer time after Brother Sandy makes his presentation. That's three good ones. <laughs> three good ones today. And we got a fourth one. So if you want to stand real quick and stretch, Sandy will come up. Uh, I really do want to thank uh, Lynn and Sarah for uh, coming on with us all the way from Cleveland, even though it is uh, technology uh, uh, aided along. And uh, we thank the Lord for them. Sandy, why don't you come up and, uh, and get your CD PowerPoint or anything like this, Sandy?